Let's bring Evan Sayette uh, in on this, our good friend. Uh, Evan's got uh, some new videos out there, and his videos are on YouTube. And uh, you can search for him by Evan Sayette, or just go to the front page, MikeChurch.com, and you can play him right there. And uh, Evan also hosted a special on the 70s. You know a little bit about Woodstock that I don't know, too, don't you, my friend? But I didn't just I didn't just host it. I, I wrote it, I produced it, and up until the very last second, I was even the, the star, the voiceover. And then they said, you know what, let's spend a little extra money uh, and get Danny Bonaducci because he's got a name that's associated with the 70s. Oh, it, made, you know, it made no difference, just took money out of my pocket because I was the producer. <laughs> but, let's ruin it, in other words. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Danny yeah, did a terrific job. He just didn't add anything to it. But they're they're so star oriented. They have to add star power to something here in Hollywood. And and the, if if you guys want to really know what Hollywood's about, there's a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, written 20 years ago by a guy named William Goldman. Uh, William Goldman. And by the way, I should have started off by saying, "Good morning, Mike. How are you?" Good morning, my friend Evan. Say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures in the Screen Trade. Uh, William Goldman, who is perhaps the, the most successful screenwriter of, of our generation, starting with, uh, even before, but his first big hit was uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Okay. Uh, he wrote All the President's Men, obviously, in the screenplay, not the book. Right. Uh, and, and all the way up through today, where he's paid a million dollars just to look over a script and, and call it either doctorate or what was called doctoring or punching it up. Uh, and, and the thesis, and he says, if there were a thesis to this book, this is it. In Hollywood, nobody knows anything. And because they don't know what makes a good movie, they don't know what makes a good screenplay, they don't even know what a good actor is. <laughs> you know, the same actor will walk into a, a, a casting agent and they'll say, you stink. Walk down the hall and they'll say, my gosh, you're great. <laughs> and, and because it's so objective, uh, subjective that nobody knows anything in this town, what they feel they have to do is attach a name to it. This is why the same six actors are in virtually every movie. And now you have this. Uh, now, now let's get back to uh, to, to to Woodstock here. Let, and by the way, you got that a little bit wrong. It's it, it, it's not a watershed moment. It's a seminal moment. A seminal. <laughs> hey, by the way, your uh, your stand up routine at uh, uh, Horowitz's. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the. Right. Restoration weekend. Re Restoration weekend was hysterical. There, there are some howlers in there. People are just going. To, you got to go to the website and watch Evan's video. It's uh, right, basically you, it's a right. It's a conservative stand up routine with with some common sense thrown in there too. Well, you know, you've never really seen me do stand up. You and I came to know each other because of the serious talk I gave the Heritage Foundation, and that's that's the first thing you've actually seen me do stand up, isn't it? Yeah. No. I, well. No, uh. Yeah. Uh, well, you've you've kind of done some here on the program. You've, you've, yeah, no, 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 I've been funny. You know, you seem to be right. funny, but we're, we're, we're the, the gist of the, you know, because I don't really know what I do for a living. When I first became uh, a conservative entertainer, because for the first 20 years of my career, I was a stand-up and I toured the country and I did okay, you know, never got to the Seinfeld level of a sitcom, but I was a headliner nationally. And, uh, but it was a rather generic act. There was no point to it. It was funny. But there was no there was no message in it. It was just uh, talked a little bit about the family, talked a little bit about uh, being Jewish, talked a little bit about this and that. Uh, but when I decided that I wanted to go out there and speak and and hopefully influence uh, you know, the the world at this juncture, this this crucial juncture in world history. Yes. Uh, I. I I put together a conservative stand-up act for the first time. Um, and along the way, while I was thinking and writing and doing all these things, that's when I came up with the ideas behind the Heritage Foundation talk. And some people know me as this extremely serious, or, you know, I mean, not, not, not uh, dour, but, uh, <laughs> but, but serious lecturer. And then they're surprised when they see me do stand-up. And others, they think they're hiring me to do my stand-up, and then I give this serious lecture, and they're thrilled, but they're but they're stunned. Well, I, I, and and the stand-up is funny, but uh, um, they got to, they had you on after Ann Coulter, and that must have been one heck of an act to follow. <laughs> well, at, at, you know, I was I was concerned, I was concerned, but then you know, one of the things I learned early on, because when I started out at clubs like the Improv in in Los Angeles. Um, and the comedy store, there was this format where every comedian would go up and do 20 minutes, and you had one comedian after another, after another, after another, all night long. 
And these comedians included, you know, J- Jay Leno would, would follow uh, Jerry Seinfeld, who would follow David Letterman, who would, and, and then you had to go up. So I'm used to following, and what you really need to learn to do is, is not try to top the person in front of you, not try to, to get your first joke, get as big a laugh as her last joke, but to do what you do and the audience will come to you uh, if, if you're good. Well, let's talk about Professor Bloom for a minute here. Let's talk about Woodstock, because that's sure. what—that's why we're here together today to celebrate the opening day of Lib Week here, <laughs> a symphony of socialist destruction here. I find it interesting that now that I'm aware that it's out there, that I see it all the time now, that I didn't even know about Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, until I met you, and now that I've read it, now I see that in conservative intellectual circus, circles, like if you go to the Claremont Institute site, if right. you search for Bloom, he'll come up in 70 papers. And uh, there, right. yeah, yeah, he is still, I, I think he accomplished what he set out to do, which was to open the American mind up. All right, if I'm wrong, let's talk about it. Why? Why am I wrong? And it's been a healthy thing here. But Bloom, if you haven't read Bloom's book, I want to read you this uh, this excerpt, Evan, from the mm-hmm. '60s, and I want to get your take on this because this is when it all began to unravel. This is what Professor Bloom, Bloom wrote uh, about the 1960s: "Freedom has been restricted in the most effective way by the impoverishment of alternatives. Nothing that was not known to our uh, to n- nothing that was not known to or experienced by those who constitute the enormous majority, which is ultimately the only authority in America." had any reality. Catering to democracy's most dangerous and vulgar temptations was the function of the famous critical philosophy. Thus, the fatal progress was accompanied by all the abstract substitutes for thought I discussed in part two. They provided an artificial